Good morning, everybody. So we're in church, right? Let's talk about some gambling. Well, in life, life is a gamble, right? We play the odds, we roll the dice all the time. Sometimes we don't even think about it. Well, I get run over, I cross the street. And if you cross the street before successfully, you may not even think about it. You simply wait for the light to change and then cross it. However, if you've never crossed the street before, or if you've been hit by a car or had a close call, you kind of think about it, right? It's a whole other story when you're aware of the risk and the risk of the unknown, right? Or, or it's unknown, when it's not named, when it's, you can't put your finger on it. Everything we do in life is a risk assessment. Is that milk still good after the expiration date? Did it milk sit out too long before? It expired before the date. Does that smell funny? Even the most innocuous tasks are risk assessments. And what about the big rocks in life? Is that the right girl for me? Do we have kids? What career path do I choose? Which major should I study? What's the destination of my soul? Those questions are all risk assessments, as we eventually do choose something, right? Right or wrong, we weigh the odds, and we choose. Anyone play the stock market? Now, even if you don't, we can all get the idea of buying and sharing a company and hoping that'll go up in value instead of down, right? Pretty common. When we work with stocks, it's our money, our retirement, our finances at stake. What if we don't pick a winner? What if the market crashes? What if that new company that was doing really great today does something really stupid and tanks tomorrow? It happens, right? You know, with stocks, there are emails, advertisements, banner ads. If you want to, the next big thing, sure bet, guaranteed return on investment. No guarantees of profits, no completely safe bets when we're dealing with stocks. They're only bets. Some are less risky, some are more risky, but they're all risky. But what if there was a sure and safe bet? What if someone had discovered a surefire, guaranteed winner? What if they were willing to let you in on it, but for a price they give you the deal? Now, in the stock market, you know, anyone with sense will be shaking their heads like, no, 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 that's too good to be true. Don't do it. Those sure bets never plan out. They usually try to trap you to separate you from your money, right? In the stock market, we don't take those bets. But what if the stakes are higher? What if the stakes were your life? You win, you live. You lose. You die. You kind of want that safe bet, right? It's a clear and simple prospect. Now, if we're not willing to risk it in the stock market, why would we ever risk it in our lives? We're not crazy, right? We'd never do something like that. I did this morning. So I took a gamble, several in fact. They paid off too. I'm still here. Those are in the room, you can see me walking around. On Zoom, you can see me on the thing. No limps. Let me tell you about those gambles, those risks that I took. First, I got in the car. You know, that thing is actually a multi-ton hunk of metal that's just hurling down the road. And we don't realize it because we do it every day, but there's no guardrails. There's no separation between me and the folks that are hurting along in their pit chunks of metal, too. At high speed. Honestly, sometimes I'm amazed we don't crash more than we do. Second, I came to a stop in that car. Have you ever seen the brakes of a car? They're tiny. They're just little pads and a disc, and they clamp on each other. And somehow they stop this big, humongous moving machine. But they do it. 
It's like magic. They're coming in the parking lot here for anybody who's here. How many of you, when you crossed, came in front of another car? I did. You take a bet, right? That car's far enough away, I can make it. We bet that we can get it across that street before they get there. You know what? I won that bet. I'm here. For those that are at home, I bet you've made similar bets too. Now, we bet those little pads and discs were made correctly, that they'll work right when we need them. We bet that hunk of metal can be steered so it doesn't hit another chunk of metal that's hurt along beside us or at opposite speed and op at, at us. These really are life and death decisions, right? We don't think about it. We just do it. If something didn't work right, broke, malfunction, you're dead. The brakes go out, you're going to go to the hospital. But we still do it. We still get in those cars, we drive them around, sometimes a bit too fast, and we don't even think twice about it, do we? Why? Why is that? If life is really a gamble, and we really are playing the odds, then why do we take some of the gambles for granted? Why do they become just old hat? Why don't we think more about it? Well, those cars just work, right? They're just there. Hopefully, if it's new and maintained, they just they work. And sometimes if they do break down, you slap a new plastic part in, and you're off and going again. In general, the car, the truck, the automobile of choice, gets us where we're going. We learn to depend on it. We learn to trust it. When we drive it every day and it doesn't let us down, it's just there. We put our lives in the hands of humans and machines for convenience as we have reasonable expectation that will get us where we want to go. Now, we've done our money. We've done our lives. What if we up the ante one more time? Take it one more step. At big poker games, the players get all the oohs and the ahs. If you ever watch those, it's when somebody just takes the chips and just pushes them all in the middle of the table. They're all in, right? Let's do that. Let's go all in. In the scenario we're talking about, let's talk about our soul. Now, be honest. When I said that, how many of you kind of tuned down? It's like, all right, I get where he's going with this. I'm good. It happens, right? When you see the end coming, you kind of tune out because it's like, ah, it's just there. But think about this. We really are all the time betting our lives, our souls, and we don't even think about it. It's just what we do every day of our lives. Just like in that car trip. We really didn't have, we really didn't have our lives in line. If we're the driver, we trust the car to go, do its thing, we simply drive. If we're the passenger, we trust the driver. So we listen to radio, play electronics, whatever we do to pass the time, we trust it's going to get there. Life gets like that. It simply happens. We haven't had to make an accounting of our lives yet. For those of us that are still here, we live in this life so much that we can get on cruise control. We can zone out. Don't think about the dangers we face every day and take for granted. But here's the catch. What happens when we zone out? What happens when we get too comfortable, too complacent? In a car, we crash. In our lives, we end up in places we really don't want to be and really shouldn't be. Now, flip that around. So we've gone from being too comfortable. What about if you're hyper aware, you're hypersensitive, and you're just on the edge every moment of the day? How do you deal with that? What if we are so hyper-aware and hypersensitive to the realities and dangers of driving that we can't get ourselves to get in the vehicle? We have a panic attack before we even get on the road. That doesn't help much either, right? We boil ourselves in our own stress juice. We miss on life by not going anywhere, and we try to wrap ourselves in a bubble of protection. We can't live like that. How do we find the middle ground 
We walk in this world where we do things that endanger our lives, our souls, every day, and we don't think about it. We can't get too comfortable, and we can't get too freaked out about it. The ground we are alert to the reality enough that we are cautious and careful, but not so overly cautious that we never leave the house. Well, we've opened up a lot of questions. Let's try to answer some of these. We're here in the service of our Lord. So let's focus on the soul-related questions, those biggest rocks in our life. Let's start with zoning out, getting on cruise control. Let's turn to our instruction manual. If you would. Turn with me to Matthew 15, verses 1 through 3. Matthew 15, verses 1 through 3. And this is where Jesus is talking to the Pharisees. And this is what it says in verse 1. And the scribes and Pharisees, who were from Jerusalem, came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? They do not wash their hands when they eat bread. And he answered and said, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God? Because of your tradition. In this situation, the Pharisees are like, ooh, 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 I got them. They didn't wash their hands. We got them. Yes. And they're focused on the here, the now, the physical, right? Jesus, I can now I'm take some liberties here, but imagine the Pharisees Paris, Paris, like, it's not your hands, crazy people. It's your souls you should be preoccupied with. Just like in our cars, we get wrapped up in the music on the radio, thinking about, did we forget something when we left? How much we need to pee when we get to our destination? We get dibs in the bathroom when we get home. We don't think about it, right? We lose sense that we're actually hurtling down the road in a big ball of death. The car we're in hasn't crashed, though. We don't hit the rig, at least not more than once. For the most part, our cars get us there without us having to think about them. It's too much. In our lives, we only get to give account of our lives once, at the very end. How do we snap out of the days and start being a bit more alert and caring? Well, in the car, we pass crashes, right? You see them on the highway. Reading the newspaper, San Jose hit a new high fatality rate this year. Something to be, I guess, sort of proud of. Not really. <laughs> we see it. Maybe even get into a fender bender ourselves. We hear about it. We can't deny that accidents do happen, right? There is a risk in driving a car. And even though we don't think about it when we get in there, it's there. And we've got to be at least somewhat alert of it. The same thing with our lives. We lose loved ones, right? We see all the loss that happened with COVID. We see what happens when there's a war. We have signs that life are fleeting all around us. We simply need to look. We can't deny that our physical lives do not last forever. That there is risk in driving these machines we call bodies that we're carrying around our souls. And once we realize that situation, frankly, it's kind of terrifying. Turn to Philippians, verse 2, 13. Philippians 2, 12 and 13. Get into verse 12. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you both to will and to do for His good pleasure. When you do see it, when it does become real, you get to that freaked out stage. You get to that, this is really going to happen. And you got to work it out. When I was young, I lived with my grandparents. I saw both of them die. I got so freaked out by death because I didn't understand it. I threw up. I didn't know what was going on. Yeah, I was a bit high strung as a kid. You ask my wife, she might agree with them still, but it's another story. When we are faced with stark reality, it is frightening. It's a scary situation when you know what's going on. You have a close call 
And you don't take life for granted afterwards, right? You know how precious it is, how fleeting it is. However, we need to realize that's not our lives that's real scare. Our soul is the ones to be focused on. Not the car crash, but the crash of our soul. If we lose sight of our God and our goal to be with Him, it's bigger than any fender bender we can get in. When we truly see situ the situation for what it is, it can lead a person to freak out. A person can get really bent out of shape thinking about death. And then when you amp that up to your soul, it gets even more. Losing our eternal soul is the real chips on the table. The all-in bet. It's freaking out. Getting that adrenaline going is good to get you moving, right? That's why God gave us fear. You got the beast in the bushes, it gets you out of there. Get your body and mind just focused, and you go. But once we got into safety, completely freaked out is not a sustainable way to live, right? It's not healthy or effective to be freaked out all the time. It spurs you to action. It gets you moving, and that's good. But you have to move on from it at some point, right? you got to calm down. How do we get to that stability and stable state? So, if you realize the chips to get you moving and get going, how do you moderate and come back? How do we get there with a the car, though? When we first started learning how to drive, anybody remember those days? Some of you may still be in them. Remember getting in that car for the first time and your heart's just... Won't be on my chest too much, but just pay bounding, right? Your alert's there. You're trying not to crash. You're trying to learn quick. Now compare that with now. For those that have been driving for years. It's second nature, right? You get in the car. You turn it on. You can go somewhere. Sometimes you don't even realize you've been driving. You're just there. We drive it calmly and regularly for years. We get to live with it. And that's how it's supposed to be with our lives, too. When we realize the stakes of our souls, it should make us tremble. We've got our lives. We've got to get our lives right with God and join His team. Then, we live our lives. We walk with God for years until it feels natural. Second nature. That's how it's supposed to be. Like driving your car. You get used to it. How do we get there, though? With stops, we worry, assess if we pick the right one, if it's going down or up, if it's the winning one. What about our souls? Do we put the same amount of emphasis on our souls as picking those stops? We mentioned that sure and safe bet. The surefire guaranteed winner. The easy bet is God, right? But that's too easy, right? Just to say, it's God. We're humans. We want to understand that. We want to get, what does that mean? Sure, choose God. What does that really mean? How do we choose God in a way that makes it a sure bet that our soul is safe? That we can be confident enough to calmly live our lives? Let's turn to a familiar parable. Turn to Matthew 25 with me, please. Now, as we read this, take a look at C. If at any time, in any place, there's ever talk about a risk of losing, about what if the money disappeared, what if they didn't do right, except for the imagination of one of the servants, you won't see it. But let's read this. Matthew 25, in verse 14. The kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them, and made another five talents. Now notice this. This guy had a lot of money placed in his hands. And he goes and does something risky with it. He played the ancient version of the stock market, of the commodities trade, and traded with them. Now, commodities are risky investments. 
the price of corn or wheat goes up and down with a big storm. You know, something happens, a train derails, big hailstorm comes through, boom, stock, the market bottoms out. All sorts of things can go wrong, and the money can go out the window really quickly. However, there's never any mention of this or consideration of that risk. The guy simply goes out and does something and gets a return. Now, if stocks are that easy, that would be awesome. Just get in the game and you win. Let's carry on. Verse 17. And likewise, you would receive two, gain two more also. Same here with the second servant. Somebody gets in the game and he's good. Really nice and simple. Let's keep on going. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. This servant chose the opposite. He sat out the game. He benched himself. Imagine we've got the 49ers in the playoff right now. Imagine if the defense decided, the quarterback, the offense, they get all the glory. I'm sitting down. Wouldn't go well, right? We would not be this far along. Now, let's keep on going. Verse 19. After a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So, he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered me five talents? Look, I have gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. This guy got in the game and won. He reaped the reward. Easy peasy, right? He gambled with a very large sum of money in a very risky situation. But there's no talk of loss. What if he's messed up? They never talk about that. They never talk about him if he lost it all. Why? Let's keep going. He also, who had received two talents, came and said, Lord, he delivered me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Again, game played, payout received, reward gained. Zero talk of risk, zero talk of loss. Let's move on. Verse 24, this is where things change. And he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping you have not sown, gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. The Lord answered and said to him, You wicked, lazy servant. You knew I reap where I have not sown. Gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have at least deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. And notice here, even with this section, there's no talk of risk. They're not saying you didn't, you just kept it safe. He's saying you didn't get in the game. There's no talk of, you're not good enough. There's no talk of, you couldn't do it. There's no talk of loss. The only risk is not getting in the game. The master even states, couldn't you at least put it in the bank? Done something with it? A little bit. If this guy had done anything, anything what his master had given him, he would have gotten a payback. The servant hid the talent in the ground. He had the fear in him. He had that trembling in him. But he never left the house. He had his money in his hands. That fear should have got him off the couch. Should have got him to take action. But instead he didn't do anything. He stood in his own juices until it caught up with him. He got the risk assessment of this all wrong. The master wasn't meaning to be scary. He was rooting for him to win. He simply wanted him to play the game and use what God had given him. 
We know this about the stories that the sin was in action. Still, the story's a bit abstract though, right? I've heard this many, many times. Why wouldn't there be risk? We know in life there's risk. You get in the car, you get accident. You invest no stocks, you lose money. What about in this situation? Why is there no risk with this? So we'll get to that at the end. Let's get to the secret. Let's jump straight to that. The secret is the deck is stacked. They're playing with a stacked hand. The master gave his servants a stacked deck so they couldn't lose. If they did anything with what they had given him, there would be payout. Imagine walking into Vegas with a stacked deck of cards. That's the situation we're talking about here. Isaiah lets the folks in on the secret back in the Old Testament. And it's the same secret to this day. Turn to Isaiah 55. Isaiah 55, 10 through 11. It begins in verse 10. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. God has given us His Word. We simply have to take it in ourselves, use it, share it. Serving the Lord is the game. This is the one where there is the guaranteed payout. We're not in this alone. It isn't us directing the work. We're not the ones placing the bets, but God. And God doesn't lose. The cool part is, God's betting on us. If we don't walk down the track, walk off of it, walk back toward the starting line, if we keep going at any pace we can manage, we win. It's that simple. Let's turn to Luke 10, 1 and 2. And this is when Jesus is sending out the 70. So this is, we've read the Old Testament, let's go to the New Testament. Luke 10, 1 to 2. Begin in verse 1. After these things, the Lord appointed 70 others also, and sent them two by two before his face into every city and place where he himself was about to go. And he said to them, The harvest is truly great, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers in the harvest. And that's it. That's the sure bet, the guaranteed win. Just get out into the harvest and we get to work alone, work serving God. Now, even in this section of Luke, it talks about sending out the 70. Not every time they go to is successful. Some would receive them, some wouldn't. But just by going out, they had won. There would be some who would listen, some who won't. But by using God's word, we get a return, a reward. There's no loss when you're serving the Lord. That guaranteed win is the serving of the Lord. But we're still talking about risk assessments here, right? And what to do with our soul. So let's dig even deeper. Let's take a look at this some more. And I know we're, we're running long on time, but we'll try to wrap this up. We know it's a guaranteed win. We know this is a stacked deck, but is that stacked deck going to be a boring game? Is your life going to be kind of just, nah, it's going long? When you get in that car and you're traveling along and it gets boring, right? Is that what you want your life to be like? No, right. We don't, right? If you've got a guaranteed win on a stacked game, we don't want it to be a boring game. But here's the cool part. With God, it's not. But there's a trick. God is the master director. He knows how to write an awesome story, to weave everything together 
in ways that we can never imagine. He writes great stories for lives that are given to him. Let's turn to Psalm 33, part of the scripture we read this morning. Psalm 33, starting in verse 18. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear Him, on those who hope in His mercy, to deliver their soul from death, and to keep them alive in famine. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our help and our shield. For our hearts shall rejoice in Him, because we have trusted in His holy name. Let Your mercy, O Lord, be upon us, just as we hope in You. Now, Sounds good, right? Sounds promising. What's this part about a hope and a shield? If it's so good, why do we need a shield? Why do you got to get weapons and defense? Let's turn over one chapter to Psalm 34. Let's look into that. Psalm 34, 8 through 10. We'll start with there. Starting in 8 and 10. Psalm 34, starting in verse 8. And it begins. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Blessed is the man who trusts in Him. Oh, fear the Lord, you His saints. There is no want to those who fear Him. The young lions lack and suffer hunger. But those who seek the Lord shall not lack any good thing. Notice this verse. Taste and see that the Lord is good. That's vivid, visceral. There's something there. This is a boring game. It wouldn't be a taste. It would be, hey, look over there. We actually got the feeling in our mouth. When a little kid wants to really develop something or understand it, they pop it in the mouth, right? God's saying, you can taste life with me. You'll know it. Let's skip down a few verses and see how he engages the senses. What happens? Skip down to verse 15. Psalm 34, 15. The eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their cry. So God's watching the righteous. He's keeping His eyes on them. Because the deck is stacked, and the win is guaranteed, why has God got to keep an eye out? If you secured your house, and everything's safe for your little kid, why are you going to watch on them? Let's go to verse 16. The face of the Lord is against those who do evil, to cut off the remembrance of them from the earth. Well, we see that it is guaranteed loss for those who do evil. So we see the opposite of things. This is the guaranteed lose. We want to see the guaranteed win. So let's go back to that. Verse 17. The righteous cry out, and the Lord hears, and delivers them out of all their troubles. Wait. Why are they crying out? Troubles? Well, what's that about? Let's go down to verse 18. Keep reading. The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and saves such as have contrite spirit. Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all his bones. Not one of them is broken. Okay. So we're getting down to brass tacks and the payment part, right? Many are the afflictions of the righteous. It's not only a guaranteed win, but it's a guarantee of afflictions. You get in the game, and action's in a sin, but you're guaranteed affliction too. It's a bittersweet deal, right? That's how God will keep us interesting for us. We're guaranteed to win, but it's guaranteed to be a difficult game. It's not going to be easy. Our lives will not be easy or boring. It's no wonder we humans like those uh, bittersweet moments of sweet and sour chicken, right? Our God set us on a path that's built for that. You get the bitter and the sweet. It's how we're supposed to expect to live our lives. Notice the next part, though. The Lord delivers him out of them all. He guards all of his bones. Not one of them is broken. Now, this is a promise that plays out literally for Jesus. And but for us, what does this mean? It means that God will bring us out of the troubles without any major harm. 
We may get a little worn. We may get some scuffs. But we're not going to be broken. We're going to make it through. Go down to verse 21. Evil shall slay the wicked, and those who hate the righteous shall be condemned. The Lord redeems the soul of His servants, and none of those who trust in Him shall be condemned. The wicked, their own actions slay them. But for God's servants, those who trust in Him, none shall be condemned. Guaranteed reward for those who get in the game and serve the Lord. Now we've discussed the secret. We're getting to the end. What about that price? On an infomercial, it's three easy payments in $19.99. That's all you got to do. But it's not that easy, right? It's a bit higher price with us. That price, that surefire, guaranteed win life, only your life, everything that you are, all that you have. To have the guaranteed win, we have to dedicate our lives to God. However, He takes our lives. He makes them better than we could ever imagine. We get to taste and see that the Lord is good. We get to feel that joy in our lives. Hard lives can be rewarding. They can be good. In the end, the Lord lives of the Lord here on earth and with eternal life with God in heaven. When we get in the game, we win. The work is not easy. It's not simple. So lots of times you'll be left scratching your head and wondering what's going to happen. Happen here. So that is the deal and the factors to consider. In the risk assessment of how, our li- how to live our lives, where our soul's on the line, we get the choice between a life that can be hard at times, but that's full of joy and ends with a guaranteed win, and a life that's not fulfilling and ends with a guaranteed loss. Will you take the safe bet of a life with God? For those who haven't, if you'd like to take this deal, commit your life to God, all it takes is a quick dip in the water of baptism to sign those commission papers. Now or any time is a good time to do so. If there's anything else that you need, the prayers of the congregation, please come forward as we stand and sing the invitation song. Thank you.